By AD 2016, the traditional canal lockkeeper was almost extinct. Now the vast majority of locks only have a roving problem solver covering a large area in a 4x4 pickup truck with a mobile phone. All very efficient, but degrading the old world charm of our old world canals. So what was it like to be a traditional lock keeper? Last time we spoke, you mentioned that you used to be a lock keeper. Can you tell us where that was and something about your duties generally? Yes, it was on the Basingstoke Canal. Um, I started there in 1991. Um, a chap before me called um, Les Foster, he'd been there for about 30 odd years. He was retiring and so I applied for the job and uh, got the job as a lock keeper looking after the deep cut flight of locks, uh, which was uh, yeah excellent. Um, I always say to people that um, lock keeper but we were sort of a bit more than that, um, even though I had the 14 locks to look after down the deep cut flight, uh, we were actually classed as rangers. Um, and some people wanted us to be called wardens um, or rangers, but um, Hampshire County Council, who owned the Basingstoke Canal, and Surrey County Council for a mash lock down, uh, they settled on rangers, but basically uh, we'd done the job and the work of a lock keeper. So, um, so that was up and down the canal. It could be anywhere. We could be anywhere, anywhere but uh, my contract um, was uh, made up so that I actually uh, looked after the deep cut flight of lock locks and also uh, the Brookwood Three, which was another mile further down. The work we did on there, it wasn't just um, doing the general maintenance uh, of the locks. We actually made our own lock gates. Uh, we replanked them, uh, re-ironed them, fitted them, um, replaced sills, replaced uh, paddle frames and paddles, uh, rendering of wing walls, um, grouting. Um, so we, we, were, um, we had a multitude of skills between us all. And um, in my days I've been a dredger driver and an excavator driver, so uh, those skills were very beneficial for the Basingstoke Canal uh, Authority. So um, we also were um, foresters, if you like, rather than tree surgeons. Um, we didn't actually climb the trees. We had contractors to do that. But uh, any other form of uh, tree work, whether they were hung up, fallen um, or dangerous, um, then we would deal with it uh, in-house. So. So you were jack of all, tra all trades pretty yeah, well. That's right, including weed cutting, um, you know, repairing the uh, banks and towpaths, um, re redoing bypasses around locks. Um, uh, anything that came our way, we, we went out and uh, tackled the job. The, uh, the towpath talk is that whenever you phone the Basingstoke Canal office, they always say there's not enough water. As an ex-Basingstoke lock keeper, do you have any opinions on what was happening there? Yes, it, I mean, right from the word go, the Basingstoke has always been short of water. Um, they were hoping that was going to be solved by connecting the Basingstoke up with the Kennet and Avon and also coming up from the uh, uh, River Itchen. But of course, with the railway coming so soon after the uh, canals were finished, or some of them, um, that was all shelved. Um, and so we actually uh, relied on mainly rainfall and in, at the Greywell Tunnel uh, we had natural springs coming in uh, to the canal. It worked out around about 300 odd thousand uh, uh, gallons a day, but it wasn't enough to keep the canal open all year round. By the time you take in um, the use of locks, the transpiration and uh, evaporation. Uh, there wasn't a lot of uh, water to get right down to the bottom end of the canal to keep all the locks open. So um, there we had quite a few leaks on the canal. Um, a lot of those were sorted out over a period of time. Um, some of the time we relied on uh, the Surrey Enhanced Canal Society who were the main force in um, restoring the canal from 1966. 
uh, right through and even now they're still working on the canal, uh, doing smaller jobs now, uh, but they were the main um, body who actually um, restored the canal, mm. which I was part of. So what actually attracted you to life in, on the canal in the first place? Uh, I suppose it starts, it started when uh, mum and dad bought a house in Fleet. We moved from Hartley Whitney um, in New Road to Fleet, uh, Glen Road. And behind the house was um, a nice open area with a corrugated boathouse there. And uh, we, as kids, about eight years old, seven, eight years old, would wander around uh, being told not to go too far. Um, and then um, the boathouse didn't have a regular opening, but when it did open, uh, I would be fascinated by all the different uh, boats in there it was dark and dingy but some of the craft in there you know were absolutely superb and even at that age you know uh, I could appreciate all those beautiful wo wooden skiffs and the uh, uh, canoes and then there were fiberglass uh, tubs and uh, and rowing boats as well and so at the weekend um, I used to go around there not every weekend just now and again I would help to clean the boats out and for that, at the end of the day, I had about half an hour use of a tub, so um, which is not too dissimilar from uh, a coracle. So, uh, so I actually got used to using a paddle, uh, doing a figure of eight, and, uh, and that stood me in uh, good stead for later years because I've always been involved with canoeing. Um, was this a natural progression to actually live on a it, canal boat? Uh, yes, I suppose it was. Um, uh, as, a, as a youngster, um, we used to go up and down the canal, we used to uh, go fishing, and then Dad managed to get hold of a, um, a two-seater kayak, uh, which would, was wood and canvas. And so David and I, my younger brother, we would go off uh, for a whole day in the canoe sometimes. Yes, so it's a good grounding um, for my love of uh, the waterways. Yeah. So when you, when you retired, you retired to the boat? Yes, it, it, and of course it all started before that. Um, when I left school, I joined the Royal Navy um, and I became a, a stoker or a marine engineering mechanic. Um, spent seven years in the Navy. Um, I was on HMS Albion and HMS Tiger. Um, and in between that, I spent a little bit of time on shore establishments in Portsmouth. And when I came out in 76, um, uh, the canal was still partly being used for boating and canoeing, uh, but no powered craft at all. Um, it was too shallow and uh, and then uh, I happened to, uh, when I got my um, uh, dog back in 81, which was, um, uh, the dog I had then was an English setter. And we were out walking around um, Winchfield and in the distance, I heard this loud snorting coming from the canal and there was steam everywhere. And I thought, what is that? And so uh, I made my way over, and there in the canal, along the bank, was this dredger, a steam dredger, and it was called Perseverance, being operated by Surrey and Hampshire Canal Society volunteers. And I was just miserable. I just thought, what a wonderful big boy's toy, you know, as they call it nowadays. So. Uh, and then over a short period of time I started to go there um, just for a couple of hours uh, of, a, of a weekend, maybe a Saturday or a Sunday morning or afternoon, just to help load the dredger up with wood and I would get the odd trip on the tugboats, uh, which was Pledge and Sparkle, uh, to go up and down the canal pushing the barges either full or empty of uh, silt which had been taken out of the canal by the dredger. And over the, over the years, um, my interests got greater and I was just enjoying um, doing the voluntary work at weekends. And so I became much more involved uh, with the dredging crew of, uh, 
of, on the canal. And, and it was just a lovely team we had um, working on the, on the canal. Um, Andy Stump was running it at the time with Brian Bain and there was uh, Peter Cager and Jim would be one, one uh, pair who would operate the steam dredger. And then there was Ian Edwards, uh, he would be operating on another day. Um, very skilled people in uh, um, operating the dredger. It's, it's a case of hand, eye and foot coordination. If you didn't have that, you wouldn't be able to operate it. And, uh, and the best way of describing it, it was just like a snorting dragon. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, yeah, so over... Uh, over time, uh, the engines started to play up. They were, they were Lister JP3s in the uh, tugboats. And so, because I've been involved with uh, diesel engines over the years, I volunteered to help strip the engines down and rebuild them. And, uh, and of course, spares are quite difficult to get hold of. And uh, somebody from the uh, Canal Society knew somebody from the Antarctic where spares were, um, which were part of the generator system, which they didn't need any longer. And all we had to do was pay for the uh, uh, carriage from the Antarctic back to England. And then we had new head, head uh, pistons and liners and, and everything else. And uh, so um, that was good. And... Um, at the time, um, there was quite a few of us involved in stripping these engines down, one at a time, so we always had a tug in operation. And I had a young lad, um, I, he was about 17, 18 at the time, his name was Spencer, and about six foot odd. And uh, so I was showing him how to strip the engines down, and, and, and we were just going through things together. and. Uh, and then he was operating the tugs as well um, after we re rebuilt the engines. And I hadn't seen him for 27 years. And I come on the Kennet and Avon uh, three years ago and he's got his own boat yard. And uh, so it was a big uh, celebration, you know, so I didn't recognise him straight away, I must admit. It was only when he saw my boat with uh, deep cut on it and he said, oh, that's the Basingstoke Canal. And uh, of course, uh, it, and I told him I was part of the dredger crew, and he said, "Well, what's your name?" And I said, "Peter Munt." He said, "Well, I'm Spencer." <laughs> so it was just, you know, drinks and meals together. It was just lovely. What you a know. coincidence, really, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, really? absolutely. It's a yeah, really yeah. big, wor you know, small world now. The big yeah. world's become a lot smaller now. So getting, getting back to your life on on the canal now. Um, some people are interested in in the rule, you know, knowing about the rules and where you can moor and um, those are things like speed limits and restrictions and so on. Can you give us a brief, very brief idea of what you're up against when you're, when you're cr uh, permanently cruising? Yeah, I mean, um, when we're actually cruising, um, majority, being a continual cruiser, a continuous cruiser, we love that style of life. We love meeting people, we love meeting the community up and down the canal. They are such lovely, lovely people. I mean, just, I just think it's, it's a great community and I wouldn't swap it for anything. Uh, but um, sometimes, you know, you're cruising around and you find mooring. Sometimes you don't, so you have to push on a little bit. Um, there are restrictions where um, it's a 14-day uh, mooring away from uh, visitor moorings. And then the visitor moorings, they're taken up should be by just 48 hour moorers and a good example is the winter which has just passed where um, we were coming from Newbury um, just wanted to stop at a, 14, uh, at a 48 hour mooring just so we could get provisions and, uh, and meet people in the various villages and they were all taken up by winter moorers and 14 day moorers. The previous winter there was a mobile uh, winter moorings so they could go um, you know um, winter moorers could moor up anywhere providing they weren't on a 14 48 hour mooring which was great because all the uh, 48 uh, hour moorings were free for continual cruisers mm. keep things basic then uh, you know 
things would be so much easier. All the rules and regulations are in place anyway. Tell me, tell me if you haven't heard this before. Right. What stops you getting cold in the winter? We have uh, a well-insulated boat and we have a diesel squirrel stove. Wonderful. And they say, where, where do you sleep? Well, we sleep in the bed like everybody else, you know. And, and we have washing machine and we have a fridge and a cooker and shower and toilet. And uh, it's, uh, we have a very comfortable home on board. Now, that's, that's the question I was going to get to. You've, you've, you jumped ahead of me there. <laughs> the toilet. What happens to the toilet? Well, they're, Does they're, it go in the water? Oh, definitely not. No, there's two, there are two types of toilet. You have um, a big holding tank, uh, which is built into the boat from when it was first made. And then uh, boaters go to uh, various points along the canal and actually pump it out, wash it through, and then pump it out again. Um, I use a porta potty. I have uh, two cassettes on board. So when one gets nearly full, then I can swap over. And when we get to the uh, Elson point along the canal, then they're taken there and uh, emptied and cleaned out. There's, there's another one that, that I've been, I don't know if you've been asked this before, you probably have. Uh, what if you want to have a bath? Well, we, we, ha we have showers. Uh, because some, some boaters do have baths, but you do need to have um, a larger water tank. I mean, ours is about 350 gallons, so uh, that will do us, you know, you know, quite a few weeks, depending on how many times we put the washing machine on. Mm. And when we do put the washing machine on, we, uh, I have an inverter on board, but I don't take the washing machine through that. I start a, um, a generator, which is a 2 kVA, Honda, which has been converted to run on gas, so I haven't got that inflammable fuel on board yeah. because the number of boats in the past which have exploded on the vapour, not the fuel, and that's what's that's the killer. Mm. Uh, now, what about the funniest question you've been asked on, in that way? What's the or the best one? What's the what's the one you think is worth mentioning? The one worth mentioning. Um, when they come past our boat you see people peering into the kitchen window or the galley window and then all of a sudden they think, they've got a cooker <laughs> and they've got a fridge, you know, as if, you know, we were some sort of uh, backward people who mm. have nothing on board, you know, mm. but uh, people are quite surprised when they come on board and see our boat. Same with a lot of others, you know. Um, there's, you know, the pe going back to the people on the cut, um, People say to me, oh, you know, your boat looks nice, you know, you look after it. Yes, it gets washed maybe once a month, no, maybe maybe twice, depending on whether we've been stuck under trees and you've got the sap on it. Um, but, you know, even the boats which might need a little bit of paint, um, you know, the people who are actually live on these boats are lovely people the inside is all lovely and I know of at least three if not four um, boaters who are jewelers mm. and of course you know they have precious semi-precious stones they have gold silver platinum on board so you know they're all locked away and say so they don't want to advertise uh, what they might have on board yeah. and so they they sell their wares, you know, through the internet or through shops, you know, in uh, places up and down the cup. Well, it's interesting that you should come to that because I was, I was going to ask you, um, because you have to move every 14 days, uh, it must make it difficult to maintain some sort of source of income. Um, do you mind me asking how, how you overcome that? Well, uh, my wife is re uh, retired, so she gets a state pension. Uh, when I was made re uh, redundant from the Basingstoke Canal, there was four of us who took redundancies. And uh, because I paid a lot of money into um, a final salary pension, um, I, live on, uh, I live on that, which is um, it's, it's, it's adequate. And when the time comes, I get my state pension, you know, then uh, that'll make it a little bit more comfortable for us. So, but we, mm. can, we can cope and... Uh, we, we can keep our head above water. <laughs> so so uh, you, don't, you don't have any other little things that are sort of more like a hobby or...? Yes, I do. Um, I do uh, dog training. I've been a dog trainer for a very long time with flat-coated retrievers, uh, which has always been my love since 1983. <laughs> the other thing uh, um, I uh, 
enjoy doing, which I have done for a long time, is making walls, walking sticks. Um, this is just one um, of, the, of the walking sticks I've made. Uh, this one, I've, it's a piece of um, black thorn, which I found uh, on the Kennet and Avon about uh, three years ago. I saw it growing out and I thought that would make a lovely stick. And so I've put a hair on the top with a little bit of uh, buffalo uh, black horn there. And yeah, it's a it's a really lovely lovely stick to so go around with. Do you ever sell any of these things? Yes. Um, what I usually do is I don't make sticks um, and then just sell them. I make them bespoke. So you don't have a shop? No. So how do you actually get the opportunity? I, I take it you don't do too many of these, but how do you go, how do you sell them when you? Well, when uh, it's usually by word of mouth. Uh, mm. When people um, see my sticks. Whenever I go for a walk, I have a walking stick in my in my hand, um, and uh, people always stop and uh, um, you know uh, Maureen laughs at it. But sometimes we're going along, and and, and uh, ladies will come up and say, "Can I can I touch your stick?" You know, so it's quite a funny thing, you know. So, <laughs> and so you know, and from there, people say, "Well, do do I make them?" and would I make them one? And uh, and so, you know, I give them a, a, one of my cards and uh, from there, um, you know, I can make a, make a walking stick for them, yes. And because uh, uh, there are other difficulties of, uh, we were talking about making, making a living possibly, some other difficulties of canal life. Um, for, for example, have you ever been frozen in? Yes, uh, been frozen in, um, snowed in and that, I suppose the worst time was about four winters ago. That was on the South Oxford Canal and near Lower Hayford. Um, and uh, we had um, flooding, severe flooding, where all the fields became huge lakes, where the river Cherwell burst its banks and no boats could go anywhere of any distance. So, and, and CRT, you know, rightly, said don't move it's too dangerous and you know and and they're very understandable when something like that happens and you know so we had we had about six inches to eight inches of snow um, that winter plus we were frozen in so um, in the winter time if I hear we're going to be frozen in I make sure the toilets are empty I've got plenty of gas plenty of diesel and plenty of water on board and, uh, and that way, if we are frozen in, majority of the time, it's not going to be more than two weeks. Mm. But um, did you find that a bit boring, though, when you were were you stuck there? No, no. I mean, uh, it's it's just a different. You just adjust slightly, you know. I mean, it's like people who might want to stay at home, you know, for you know two or three weeks mm. without going out. And uh, but after two weeks, then you start getting itchy feet, and you just want to mm. push on to the next place you know you, you fancy stopping at and we never make any serious plans um, because things happen. Um, um, what do your friends and relatives think of your lifestyle and in particular your wife Maureen what does she think about? Well, Maureen this? absolutely loves it you know she, she, she loves the, the way of life on the canal um, she loves being away from the hustle bustle of everything uh, most of her life she was in retail um, as manager of a, a toy shop and then of a Belgium chocolate shop, which was rather nice. Um, uh, and the family, they absolutely love um, us being on the, on the boat, but they were a little bit wary and cautious to start off with, thinking, um, all right, Dad, you're going to enjoy it, but, but Maureen isn't, you know, and of course... Uh, you know, Maureen loves it as much as I do. So, um, uh, and it's great. The, the, you know, all the family come on board. Um, they enjoy having a cruise, you know, down the canal. Or sometimes just to come on board, visit us, and we don't go anywhere. So what are your plans now? Where are you going to move to next? Uh, well, um, <coughs> later this year, we're going to go down to um, London, uh, up the Grand Union. And uh, then we'll make our way... Uh, onto the uh, Gloucester and Sharpness Canal. Um, we have a wedding to go to in August. Um, and then we'll have a little um, 
cruise around uh, the Midlands, uh, depending on how much time we've got and what the closures are for, the, for this winter, then what we'd probably do is, um, if we can get up to Macclesfield uh, Canal, then we, can, we will. If not, we'll just uh, come back here for winter around about October time. So what you're doing really is you're, you, you generally live around the Wiltshire area? It, for, for the time being, yes. Yeah, and I yeah. think, you know, because yeah. you, you know, we have family um, up in uh, North Hampshire and also um, Maureen has a daughter who's in Wiltshire as well. Um, so we like to cruise around this area. Mm. But uh, during the winter months, we like to be west of um, Kintbury because that's where the Kennet comes into the um, uh, canal and that can be, um, yeah, it can be a bit daunting for some people. And to be honest, I'd rather have a nice, easy life on a canal mm. without having to worry mm. about uh, flooding and what have you. So, um, yeah. So it's almost as if you go off for a summer holiday. <laughs> yeah, I suppose. <laughs> on, the, it, on the boat and then come back to the, it, it, to the very... That's right. I mean, yeah. you know, twice we've tried to get off, but uh, unfortunately I, I've had, uh, you know, a little bit of problem with the engine. Um, the engine I have on board is a Lister JP2. And um, about 15 months ago, I discovered that um, I had a, a crack in the piston and also a, 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 hot, a small rusty hole and a crack in one of the liners so I just changed all the liners, the two liners and put new uh, pistons and rings, had the two heads overhauled and, uh, and put all back together. So, uh, so that, that took up quite a bit of time and uh, you know going back to CRT you know I find that if, if you phone them up before the event uh, before you overstay uh, and explain to them that look, I have a, engine pro a serious engine problem, I have all this work to do, I don't know how long it's going to take and every time I've phoned them up for whatever reason they've always said that is fine, it's not a problem, just keep us informed, let us know when you're going to move. Well, what happens uh, if you're cruising somewhere and you, you need to see a doctor? I mean... Well, you know, um, you have a right to go to any surgery in the country. Um, that was, um, that's one thing that was agreed in the 1948 Act of the NHS. And so we can go walk into any surgery and see a doctor. Um, the, the best ones I found going away are the walk-in surgeries. Um, uh, they, they've been really great. I mean, I, I think the best one I've been into was the one at Banbury. You know, walked in there, I had an appointment within hours of, of, uh, of walking in or phoning them up and, uh, and they, they were very, very good indeed. You know, we don't have a problem, uh, although we are, we are registered or, uh, at Great Bedwin here uh, and the surgery here is absolutely excellent and the staff and the doctors, first class, you just can't fault them, you know, really, really good. And also they are very boat friendly. So, and everybody mixes and chats to everybody. There's no class distinction. Nobody's got any uh, problems with what people do or how they live. Everyone is accepted, you know. So it's, it's, just, uh, it's just brilliant, you know, so. Peter, what a wonderful point to say thank you for the interview and for telling Pleasure. us all about your life on the canal. Lovely, thanks very much. Thanks very much. Bye. It was in 2022 that Pisa made a nostalgic visit to his old lock cottage. It was an ideal opportunity for Peter to add some detail to his lock keeper's life story. These are the wing walls, the entrance going into the top gates here. Um, quite often we would have to render them if the boats have been hitting them and damaging the rendering. 
and you can see here that uh, the, the outer wing walls along here have been replaced quite recently. You'd have to put a, da a coffer dam across here, uh, drain this bit of water, do all the brickwork and quite often what we used to do was put a clay behind the brickwork to stop any water going through the brickwork and then going round the lock. And we, didn't, we did that on quite a few locks further down uh, the deep cut fly to locks. And just here we have um, stop plank grooves where we would put all the boards out, a much quicker method of draining the front section of where the gates are for us not only to do the rendering but also to remove uh, the upper gates. These are a typical pair of lock gates we would have built uh, years ago. As you can see, these are new ones. It's all, uh, the framework is all uh, made with green oak and the planking is dry uh, softwood, usually pine. And you can see on the corners and where all the bars go across, uh, they are reinforced with galvanized T bars and L bars. Uh, it would take about five or six weeks to make a pair of gates and uh, after from measuring to finish. This is a wild uh, weed cutter which I used to operate uh, many years ago. Um, it's paddle driven so we can operate the paddles in either direction. Uh, that may, meant we could spin on a sixpence. Uh, this one has a cab. Uh, the other one we had was open deck and the arms at the front, um, at the end we used to have a hydraulic cutter on there and then we'd operate down the centre of the canal cutting the weed where it was required and once we cut about half a mile we would then uh, put the weed cutter onto the bank, change the implement to a rake and then go back in the opposite direction and uh, gather all the weed up and deposit that on the non-topar side of the canal, fairly close to the edge so that all the um, dragonfly larvae and also the damsel ones uh, would go back into the canal and we wouldn't lose any insects which had come out with the uh, um, weeds. Well, this used to be our cream tea garden many years ago. Uh, we had wonderful trade here. People couldn't drive here. They either had to walk, cycle or come by boat. And we've done a really good trade here. Excellent. Unfortunately, it's all starting to be overgrown, including the garden at the front. Uh, yeah, quite sad to see it like this, really. But um, there we are. That was many years ago when it all happened. Well, this is a very rare site, a saw pit. This is only one of two found on the waterways in this country. Um, before the cottage was built, there was a workshop and blacksmith shop. And before the fencing was put up along here, um, there was direct access to the lock. The barges used to come in with the timber, long stretches of uh, either oak or pine. They would be rolled over and they would be put across here. They used to use dog irons to clamp it together and then two men, one on the top, one down the bottom and they used to use a double-handed saw and they used to slice the timber with the saw straight down each side so that they could make the actual beams or the um, uh, lock gate um, balance beams and, uh, and also the um, either heel or head of the lock gates. This is how the news travels on canals. It's also a great way to find out which are the best local pubs and shops. Also good for advice on navigation hazards in the canal ahead.
people living on their boats. This is a common scene on our waterways. But who are these people? How did they come to be living on boats? How do they make a living? A few years ago, I started a tour of our canals and rivers. This has brought me into close contact with a community that has time to stop and talk, just like stepping back in time. This film records the lives, backgrounds, and aspirations of these people. We're going to meet a variety of cruising boaters, real people who have allowed us to peek at their lives on water. We're going to find out what a cruising life is like when you're not allowed to stop for more than 14 days. We take a cruise with a retired lock keeper and his wife and find out the nuts and bolts of going through locks, fixing an 80 year old classic engine, and even what happens to the rubbish. Most cargo carrying barges are long gone, but still surviving are some fuel boats. We hitch a ride and find out more. Six years in the making, this is a fascinating insight into the hidden world of the canal people.